Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the September 9th regular meeting of council. And I'd like to welcome back uh, our CAO, Fred Manson. Welcome back, Fred. The city of Parksville recognizes the people of the Coast Salish Nations and their territory upon which we gather with gratitude. First item I have tonight is the minutes of the council meeting held August the 17th. Uh, do I have a mover and a seconder? Moved by Councillor Salter, seconded by Councillor Patterson. Are there any errors or omissions? All those in favor? Opposed? Thank you. That is carried. I now need an approval of the agenda for tonight's meeting. Moved by Councillor Salter, seconded by Councillor Greer. Are there any errors or omissions? All those in favor? Thank you. Well, we have three delegations tonight, and I think tonight's going to be a, a highlight for the delegations for, for this year anyway, because our first uh, delegation is the Parksville Downtown Business Association, the uh, Youth Ambassadors Report, and we're all looking forward to it. And uh, from reading the, uh, the contents of the report, I know that our youth and our future of our, of our city is in good hands because it's a really well-written report and we're looking forward to it. Um, would either of you um, like to introduce the gentleman and come up to the, uh, come up to the microphone and make yourself at home? <coughs> I'm short, so I think this will work anyway. Um, thank you for inviting us back to report on our activities this summer. Uh, Austin Smith, Aomi Jokoji, um, proved to be above and beyond our expectations, both in terms of who they were as people and what they were able to accomplish with a very loose framework to work with. You'll see as they present tonight that as we um, started out hoping just to get people from the park across the highway and into our businesses the project turned into so much more so i will pass it to austin and Naomi with my thanks and uh, ask that any higher level questions that are above and beyond uh, the scope of what they were able to do uh, get posed to me or sandy and for those in the audience that aren't familiar, these two young gentlemen were uh, hired by the Parksville Downtown Business Association at the beginning of the summer to, uh, to exactly do that, be youth ambassadors and talk to our visitors with, and their, while they were here. And we're going to find out as of now. Gentlemen, go ahead and as of now, give us your report. We're looking forward to it. Thank you. Um, before we start, I just want to apologize in advance. I'm currently uh, a little sick. Um, so. Uh, just in advance, if there is issues, I apologize. Uh, so anyway, uh, Youth Ambassador Project Report, as you guys can see. Uh, it ran from June 22nd to August 28th. Uh, okay. uh, we'll have a brief introduction here. So the goals of this project were to form a connection between the uh, park and commercial areas. Uh, we wanted to push people to our website as well as interact with the PDBA members, which was a factor that, though wasn't one of the original goals, really developed as we continued. The results, um, in brief, were very successful as far as we could tell. Um, the public loved it, visitors and locals, as well as we had a lot of networking done um, with the local businesses in person, which they really enjoyed, because um, it was something they never experienced, really, um, to this degree. The questions received were going to be, oh, yeah. Sorry. We received a wide range of questions from locals, especially locals, which we never actually um, figured we would receive a high amount from, but visitors fluctuated through the holiday season from June to August. And as we had the, hol the stat holidays of BC Day and Canada Days were our highest traffic days with mounting to the many questions. Although not as we expected, we still, that was the peak of our question quantity. So anyway, the majority of questions asked too were in regard to us and the PDBA. Uh, again, something, not something we really expected. Um, there's 97 total, so just shy of 100. Um, and you'll see in a graph coming up, it was far above uh, other questions. Um, it often led into more questions as well, um, because people get, you know, who are you, what are you doing? And as we explain, they realize information is ready for them. Um, did we further elaborate? Uh, elaborate, pardon me. Um, the majority of questions were asked by locals too. Uh, in regards to who we were. Uh, who 
food and beverage is uh, the next big one. Adventure attraction tourism after that and shopping as well. Um, most people were actually asking for general things. They weren't looking for specifics as much. Uh, and this was relevant for each of them. The next slide, please. Lastly, uh, was events was the next highest. Interestingly enough, though, we actually included Beach Fest originally in events and had to divide it due to the high amount of Beach Fest. You can see 35 and 27. If they were still combined, it would rank second highest. Um, definitely beach uh, events were a huge thing that people loved. And often they wanted them now and up close, which was interesting to us because uh, due to the lack of local events, we often had to send them outside of the downtown Parkville area to satisfy their needs, which is interesting to note. Um, and lastly, received questions were often spontaneous. Uh, it wasn't anything like a visitor center where people had you know, a list of questions and asked us. Mostly once they realized what was happening, uh, we got a lot, of, uh, a lot of questions then. So that's why we got, did get a lot of uh, who we were, uh, food, events, things like that. We didn't get much accommodations, travels, kind of what we expected. So. This shows a rough idea how many responses we collected over the span of the two months we were working, with the peaks being Canada Day and BC Day respectively. And from telling from this graph, we, we didn't have a predictable way of really knowing what we would get. And we have some weekends where we worked and some weekends where we didn't work, most of them. But um, as the number of responses just gradually went down as we um, progressed into September. Here we have PBDA ranking top, fortunately because everyone's wondering, what are we doing? Um, and that would just lead into the other questions such as food, beverage, attractions. It's, it's encouraging to see that the complaints were somewhere towards the lower, lower, lower part of the scale. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and then there is a, a, a section coming up too that will deal further with complaints, but you are definitely right. They uh, did not rank as high as uh, we'd originally expected. We had a, a couple of uh, interesting ones at the beginning too, so glad it worked out that way. So uh, people and pedestrian traffic. So uh, in general, this is uh, who we dealt with as well as uh, who, uh, who they were, I guess. Um, so locals, visitors from BC and visitors from Alberta were definitely the highest. Uh, locals is obvious and we, can get, we attribute a large amount of BC and Alberta uh, probably due to, you know, out, uh, uh, pardon me, exterior factors that led into it. Um, the beach park area was definitely the busiest with the rest of Parksville having an even distribution throughout it. So in total, we had 277 parties ask meaningful questions. Uh, many more asked questions or, and uh, talked to us and whatnot, but what happened was often once they knew we were there, we saw a lot of repeat customers, we called them, uh, and they would love to see you know, how we were doing, um, what was happening. We wouldn't count them because it would skew the results. Um, because, uh, if they did say something meaningful, we would count them, but. Uh, in total, we talked to 277 with a lot more. I'm guessing probably about another 100 on top of that. Questions received were 50% locals and 49% visitors, so almost half and half. Um, really awesome. We thought uh, how many visitors, or sorry, locals were talking to us. We never expected that. Um, of the visitors, 33% were BC and 8% were Alberta. Um, also, the amount of locals asking questions decreased later in August due to the fact many talked to us in the beginning and saw them repeatedly, but they didn't really contribute anything again later, as I mentioned. Uh, and lastly, one thing that uh, we encountered too uh, were tourist groups that could not speak English tended to avoid us. We definitely saw a lot down there, which um, you'll see coming up to another graph is not reflected by our statistic, statistics. Pardon me. Um, we attribute this mostly that it's a little uncomfortable. It's not like the visitor center. It's a little less formal. Um, so we attribute that to why they weren't showing up. That's just our opinion. We don't really know. Okay. There's a couple more points on there that actually we just missed, sorry, but uh, obviously the hot spot was going to be the park. We received 80% of questions from Beach Club to Community Park. Uh, with the rest, really, it's pretty evenly distributed with a couple highlights on Alberni Highway, Craig Street, and Corkville Street. Uh, 
we, we noticed people uptown knew, or pardon me, in the Parksville downtown area away from the beach, um, they knew where they were going. Um, they often didn't stop to ask questions, and the questions they did ask were in regards to where can I find this. Uh, also, 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. appear to be peak hours for pedestrian traffic. Um, again, this is not done scientifically. It was just these are all our impressions, which a lot of this is. Um, if an event was planned, it was definitely busier, um, with Summer of the Sea Market definitely having a large impact on that. And uh, before 12 p.m., it was definitely mostly locals walking around, too, that we encountered. Uh, and lastly, many visitors we talked to tend to be repeat visitors, so interesting to know. That last set, uh, sorry, uh, was on um, uh, Visitor Origin, I believe, too. Uh, it was up there for a while, so. And this one was on uh, location of interaction. So as you can see, Waterfront was the major one. Uh, we actually divided these into individual streets, but due to certain streets having one or two or zero, we decided to compact them just for the sake of uh, analyzing data, basically. So you can see definitely Waterfront is a big one. For the wayfinding experience, we have uh, experienced throughout the two months we were working. Um, generally a bit unpleasant and um, in some cases, and we found that um, cars around the downtown um, area are a bit speedier than what we would uh, like and felt we felt uncomfortable and the tourists that were walking around also, um, and locals mentioned it to us, and both cyclists and people using um, mobility scooters um, also voiced the same um, opinions regarding these uh, sidewalks and um, public pedestrian walkways. There was, what, there was a complete lack of pedestrian signage in Parksville downtown, which um, there was signage, but they were not primarily named for um, pedestrians, so it was not as focused for a walking experience. And um, visitors were unable to um, identify where they were exactly in town without have some help or hints to uh, kind of, you are here type of things. Uh, one thing, too, that we didn't encounter that was very interesting is Visitors were making comments down at the waterfront. We did encounter most of our questions, saying they were hesitant to head uptown, um, as they often referred to it as, uh, due to the fact that they didn't know where they'd be going. Um, this is you know, locals obviously didn't have that issue, but visitors we talked to definitely encountered this. Um, it came up more than once. <laughs> definitely, it was enough to be um, put on here. Um, so it's definitely an interesting thing to know. Um, public parking lots were also hard to locate. We found. Not so much us, but visitors were telling us. Um, as well as some locals, visitors expressed interest in an event board um, with updates on what was happening downtown in the area. Um, mostly, again, down at the beach where they would want to test from. Uh, and next up, too, we decided to create a heat map. Uh, so this was our impression of where we found areas to be the most comfortable and most uh, unnerving to walk along. There's very few areas that, um, so there is a few areas that we found <laughs> especially uh, a struggle to walk along. So the long stretch between uh, McVickers and Corfield is definitely a, on the island highway that is, uh, is an uncomfortable one, mostly due to cars speeding up extremely fast. Um, the crosswalk uh, across from Dairy Queen there, on again over the island highway, was the one where we encountered the most issues for sure. We saw many near collisions, many driving issues all in there, mostly due to cars going too fast, and as soon as that red light hits, they're not in the right spot. Uh, that was definitely one. Uh, down, uh, <coughs> pardon me, uh, across the, from the beach club there, uh, which actually doesn't exist in this photo due to the date when it was taken, um, that's also another one The bushes intrude upon sidewalk and really push you off almost. You're neck to neck with the traffic, it's uncomfortable. There's two crosswalks between uh, on uh, Bagshaw there uh, as well. They are uh, they're long ones, and there tends to be cars wanting to turn into them onto Bagshaw. That is, uh, and often it can take a while, and then when they get an opening, they go regardless of whether there's pedestrians there. Sometimes um, the other red spot, which might be personal bias, is that uh, small road on Weld Street. We did encounter lots of issues there. Our office is also on Weld Street, so it might be a little personal bias there. It's a one-way street, and people seem to think that was optional. Uh, so, 
those are the main areas we found. Uh, most of the areas that you can see are good. Our memorial was awesome. Uh, most of Jensen's awesome. It's mostly along the island highway that is most difficult for pedestrians walking. Uh, one thing we did not mention in um, our slideshow here, our slideshow here, um, because it was very small uh, but very big at the same time, was the Parksville Downtown Business Association member visits. Um, this was something that was never originally planned uh, when we started this, and what we began doing is just visiting each business, and it had amazing results. Um, there's not a lot to say about it, but it, again, it, it, it's hard to basically uh, uh, say how amazing it was for us. Um, we interacted with 94 businesses in total. Um, we talked to more. Oftentimes, we didn't get to get to the owner or manager, though. Um, we visited both retail and professional, um, and people loved the personal visits. Um, Very welcoming, every business. Mm -hmm. We had the luxury we were able to go in and really talk. I mean, most times it was very brief; it wasn't too long. But some people loved having the chance to Give really us small tours and just let them let us know what they're offering for the their business. So that was a small thing there. Um, small hit. Uh, so community atmosphere. So there's a few things here. This miscellaneous uh, positive, negative feedback voiced by the public, as well as experienced by youth ambassadors. We tried to temper it out so we didn't get uh, one-off issues. Uh, motion in regard to the community park and improvement of the community atmosphere. Uh, so the park is almost an always fantastic experience for locals and visitors, although uh, there is a few issues. Um, it's clean. Uh, city workers are friendly. Uh, Visitors love it. Locals love it. It's great. Um, the issues that we did arise, and these are again, as you mentioned, uh, complaints. Um, there was a dead seal. Um, people were not a fan of that. We got complaints throughout our two months there that no action was taken in regards to it. Um, a lack of bylaw enforcement too, um, with the specifics being cigarettes. People were smoking cigarettes. We are down there once, and that planter in the picture actually um, caught, caught fire, <laughs> and we had to play impromptu firemen. It was definitely something that, uh, even though there's cigarette, uh, there were signs saying no cigarette smoking was allowed, um, people again treated that almost as optional. Um, the other one being uh, dogs was a big, big being factor. Being off with the, this actual picture here. <laughs> that dog, that, actually, yeah. interestingly enough, his name was Frank. He was a beautiful picture there, but he ended up running over to some lady who was sun tanning, completely unaware, and ran her over. Um, just coincidentally, it happened to be the one we took a picture of. So. It was definitely an issue that we encountered throughout. They were off leash, uh, as well as their being left inside vehicles. Um, some people expressed they wanted a number or something down there that they could call if they saw this happening. Uh, and then lastly, owners not picking up their pets was an issue that, though we didn't see a lot, again, we did get a lot of complaints. Um, and lastly, the construction of the bathrooms, people felt was done at an inconvenient time. Obviously, it's done now, and it's working awesomely, as far as we can tell. Um, but when the construction was happening, People felt yeah. few complaints. Yeah. It should have been done yeah. before the summer. So. Parks of downtown is usually litter free, and the only one major we found throughout the um, downtown area was cigarette butts being mostly everywhere, fortunately. And with a couple of um, encounters of um, unsightly items such as drug par paraphernalia, as uh, shown above here. And that picture actually was taken um, at the thrifties at the Corfield Plaza. So. It was early in the morning, and that is drug paraphernalia. The picture doesn't really uh, show it too well, but um, there wasn't a lot of that. Uh, this was, as you can say, very early on in our um, endeavor, and never saw it after that. So. And lastly, businesses have certain factors that uh, depreciate the atmosphere of Parksville downtown. Uh, again, this is mostly from uh, comments we've received. So we were told there was an unpolished downtown environment um, due to the outdated appearances of many businesses. Uh, poor signage and branding for local ones as well, uh, as well as business hours are very inconvenient, inconsistent, and short, even during high traffic times. Um, there is a, Sunday was a big issue too. We did work a couple Sundays, and it, it really quiets down which is tough for visitors often because at the beach they would ask, where can I go? And our uh, palette of options was severely limited because of that. So interesting thing to know for sure. And lastly, certain aspects of the personal community portray a uh, low quality image. Uh, 
So one of the big things that we actually encounter a lot was Parksville downtown has no focal point. No one exactly knew um, where Parksville downtown really was. Like, where's some central point? It's like, you're here, and but they never knew. Had a solid idea with locals, too. Um, Generally, they were looking for some area where they could signify as Parksville downtown. Locals knew there was Parksville downtown. They often didn't know the exact borders of it by any means. It was often, uh, they knew they were in it. They weren't sure what it was. Um, so definitely focal point was major. Um, I mentioned earlier activities and events near the parts of downtown, uh, downtown area are very few. So consequently, when we were talking to people, they had to be sent farther away um, when looking for uh, events, again, other than the Summer Sea Market, which seemed to be uh, a big seller. And uh, the old Parksville Beach Resort, too. We got lots of uh, locals, especially, that weren't a big fan of it. Everyone's throwing out their own ideas, but uh, same yeah. message. Uh, and a couple more points. Homelessness is too common and too prominent in active areas of the city. Um, certain families did come to us um, asking us to do something, which obviously we have no power or decision making. Um, and then lastly, a few bike lanes. Again, this does stem back to certain bikers would come to us with the uh, pedestrian experience being uncomfortable. They want their own lanes. I don't, I don't, we don't know how feasible it is, but we did get that a few times. And from visitors, too. So that is it. Well, thank you very, very much. That's a, that's a great report. And there's a lot of things in there that I think most of us on council already know about and we're working on. But there's a few surprises for me, and I'll talk about that later. So I, I want to start off with members of council. Uh, Councillor Greer, Councillor Salter, and Councillor Oates. We'll do that in that order. So Thank you. Thank you, Worship. Um, thanks very much, guys. That was a very interesting job that you had all summer. Just one question. Um, were you asked or were, were there any complaints about uh, the activity on the beach or the lack of activity, like sports events, um, you know, where people can rent different things to use? And because really when I go down there, it's quite quiet. There's very little happening. Did you have any ideas or given to you and what we might do to liven the beach up in the summertime? At the beginning, um, we had a lot of... Um requests from activities such as paddle boarding and unfortunately the, the guy who usually does it wasn't running so um, we, we couldn't really refer them anyone to um, Parksville Beach but um, about halfway around August or beginning of August the beach club um, started a, a paddle boarding service and that's been a kind of a go-to hit for many um, visitors and locals. For activities yeah paddle boarding and kayaking as Amy was saying were number one uh, we received that a lot and luckily as you're saying uh, we did have that covered. There was no specific ideas per se. There was um, people throwing out, you know, fun little things. Um, but there was definitely a call for people wanted activities on the beach or at the park. Uh, people really enjoyed the Canada Day on um, Little Market that was going on. They really like we should get more of those and just things like that. Uh, Kids Fest and as you can see, two questions regarding Beach Fest were also very prominent. So definitely people were looking for something to do at the beach, visitors and locals alike. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Salter. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that uh, presentation. That was that was a really good presentation. It sounds like you guys had had a good time doing doing this, and, uh, and I think it was very valuable for us too. Um, my question is, what sort of um, activities or what referrals were you making um, to people that was not available in the Parksville area? What what were those? What were those activities that people wanted to do that weren't available here? Uh, as in regards to what they want, it was it's difficult to uh, say. Oftentimes we did get very general. I'd say I want an event, uh -huh. um, and we would basically give them what they were looking for. Or, uh, sorry, pardon me. Uh, we would give them what was available. Uh, as for what we were referring them to, um, it was often very. Uh, general things if there was nothing going on, um, which we encountered a lot. So I think Cathedral Grove, well, not an event, it's an activity oh, obviously, see. but I would send them there. Uh, people love farmers markets as well, so Qualcomm, uh, there's the one down in the news, uh, things like that. It, markets was a big one for sure. Uh, specific shopping requirements too. Mm -hmm. There was Very specific. I want this. And this. Occasionally, yeah, we did get the specific specific thing where Nanaimo would be where we'd have to send them. They were looking for a store or something that wasn't available. Um, 
events, though, was more, I don't think people generally had something in mind they were looking for. They just wanted something. Uh, as far as the people that asked us, if that makes sense. Councillor Oates. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you very much. <coughs> Uh, really appreciate the report that you gave us here tonight. It's uh, comprehensive, it's detailed, it provides a lot of valuable information, and it's obvious that you put a sincere effort into doing it, and it sounds like you had a lot of fun doing it. Uh, so uh, thank you very much, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's good for us to hear that your unique perspective, because I believe you did have a unique perspective as, uh, as youth and interacting with uh, visitors and businesses and locals. You were able to glean a lot of information, and uh, and the effort that you made in putting it into your report tonight, I I, I truly truly do appreciate it, uh, and uh, thank you for your passion for for our city. Uh, I personally seen you lots during the summer. I spent a lot of time down in the park. I seen you guys around lots, and and uh, always appreciated your uh, your uh, your uh, approachable uh, demeanor, and, and I think people uh, uh, appreciated that. But if, if we were to wave a magic wand here today and give you infinite control and infinite power, and you were king, what would you do to improve our lot in life here in Parksville? I'll speak for myself. I'm not sure if Naomi will feel the same way. Um, obviously, we didn't want to make too many conclusions. I mean, we were out there collecting facts. Um, for us, the biggest issue that we encountered were our own individual opinion as well as visitors and locals was the experience of walking around, the uh, pedestrian experience. Island Highway proposed a lot of problems. Oftentimes, we had to actually purposely limit ourselves um, when talking to small families to certain areas because we knew that from what they were talking about, they would not be comfortable along those certain roads. So definitely, the for me at least, the pedestrian experience would be the number one thing uh, that I would look into handling. I personally quite agree with them. It would be a very effective way of solving a huge problem. And I personally not a biggest fan of walking around parks, but if you know if it got a bit approach much more um, comfortable to walk around, I can definitely see that livening up the downtown atmosphere and all, really inviting the families and just everyone to walk up and explore what's available in the parks area. One, more, one, sure, more. Go ahead. one other question unrelated. In the, the end of your presentation, you spoke about the homelessness and you said that you were approached by a couple of families. Were that, were that people that were talking about the homelessness issue or that were families that were homelessness that were in need? Uh, that Specific so encounters in public um, areas such as the park. And yeah, so, yeah, so it was non-homeless. It was families that were uh, concerned. Um, one particular incident was uh, a family approached us there was a man sleeping, and uh, they were worried about their children because uh, he was very close to the public area. Um, so there was a few incidents uh, like that. Uh, thank you very much. The Downtown Business Association should be proud of you. You're fine ex ambassadors uh, for them, and certainly fine ambassadors for the city as well. Thank you very much. And now, Councillor Beale, and you're going to find out that Councillor Beale is vitally interested in what you had to say because she's working on a committee, and some of her committee members are in the audience tonight, so they're going to be benefiting very much from this report. Councillor Beale. Uh, thank you, and, and thank you very much for your presentation today. And uh, I won't be yelling at you like I did down the street, but you were great at coming over to see me, even though I got your attention in a rather unorthodox way. Um, yeah, I just want to thank you and also that um, certainly a, a lot of the information, in fact the bulk of the information that you brought forth here, I think confirms what many of us have intuitively uh, felt about the experience, especially as pedestrians and also as cyclists and, and wanting to have a more inviting and um, you know, easily, easily interactive uh, downtown at the heart of Parksville. And as uh, Mayor Lefebvre uh, alluded to, uh, there are other people in town who are wanting to look beyond the downtown, but certainly consider the downtown and just think about ways that the pedestrian experience can be enhanced for uh, the benefit of locals and also visitors alike, and also for all various ages, so different needs. 
So thank you for this information and um, I'm sure and I trust that it, it won't be in vain, it won't be for naught that, uh, that we'll be able to move forward with this uh, as it confirms and it fits in very nicely with our community plan and also of course with the, uh, the goals of the Downtown Business Association. So thank you. Councillor Powell and then Councillor Patterson. Uh, thank you, Worship. First of all, thank you very much for your presentation. I've heard great things about you as I'm the liaison for the PDBA. And I'm sorry I missed your last presentation. I heard it was fantastic. Uh, Councillor Oates actually asked the question I was going to ask about the homelessness. And um, when you, uh, it's too common. When you say too common, can you specify or s expand on that? It was, this is something that we definitely did see homelessness as we were walking around. Uh, generally, as we got on uh, into the day, it wasn't very prevalent. There was uh, a few issues, as I was uh, saying to Council Oates. Uh, most of the homelessness issues we received were from locals or visitors. Uh, we weren't sure for some of them. Some were just offhand comments that they, they said, can you do anything about this? This is an issue. And no, they walked away. Um, so it was something we definitely we didn't see, but it came up enough that it had to be noted. Follow up. Um, so one of the things that maybe I can bring up at the next PDBA meeting is the uh, number, because we do have a homelessness task force in town, and they're pretty responsive. If you find somebody that's homeless, they'll come right out, touch base with them. There's a bunch of services wrapped around that. And so maybe that could be on the website if it's such an issue downtown. So, thank you. Councillor Patterson. Thank you, Worship. And thank you, gentlemen. I, um, being in the downtown, I got to see you out and about um, quite a bit. Um, this is the first year for a youth ambassador um, program, and I'm really hoping that the PDBA will continue it in the future. Um, but if they were to do that, is there any recommendations for the next youth ambassadors that you would pass on to them that you might do differently or uh, suggestions? There was actually a, uh, another section of the report that we passed on um, to Pam there um, in, due to, uh, in regards to operation, so things that we felt uh, can be improved on, things that you know we've changed. I mean, big to small, I mean, something like the shirts, for example, the kind of things, hats. Um, so, uh, there's certainly a lot of things. Um, some of the biggest things I think we felt were um, uh, make sure you deal well with people. We, we did get it open. Um, we had an iPad that we used to um, also keep statistics, but also um, pull up information that we didn't have in our mind. But, um, we had spotty Wi-Fi access, and that's something that we had to kind of move along. That we had to be in a relatively decent place for Wi-Fi, or we wouldn't have that resource available. And that was kind of the kind of don't got to remember more things or something like that. It, 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 yeah, it's a tough one to ask. I mean, generally, there's lots of little things, uh, but generally, as well as they, as long as they can work well. With people because we did receive a lot of questions that were some were very nice some were uh, kind of aggressively some were just peculiar <laughs> we just question I think we got was how much we love Godzilla so definitely interesting things like that. just a quick follow-up thank you so now that you've done this and now that you've had the experience um, I'm hoping that you've gained a lot of <laughs> of experience and life experiences, but would you do it again? I definitely would. I won't speak for Naomi, but it, it's something that I really enjoyed. Um, <laughs> really opened my eyes to, uh, especially, it was a lot to do with tourism and whatnot. Uh, you see that aspect of it. Um, I mean, overall, it's just such a fantastic experience. We met tons of people um, all across the world, we met business owners, and we got everything we could have wished for. What grades are you gentlemen going into? We are currently in grade 12 now. You're in grade 12, so this is your final year. And for myself, I would want to pass it on to another youth, just maybe under my age or something. 
so they get that same experience that I got, which is a very rare one, to be to be quite honest. And it was it was a very valuable one as it is, but um, I think it was more worth it to get someone else that hasn't had that experience before to really get a taste of what what kind of job it is and gain that experience that not many jobs have to offer. Awesome, thank you. Well, I want to thank you very, very much. You've, you've confirmed a lot of the challenges that we know that we face, and we're working on them. And hopefully, uh, by the next time we get a, a report from youth ambassadors, some of these things will be off the, uh, off the report. But the, other, the thing that interested me, and it, it's a small item, but I, I didn't realize that cigarette butts uh, you know, specifically cigarette butts in the community park were, were a problem. When I go to the community park, mind you, I don't look down very much. I'm looking around or I'm walking on the beach or I'm in the water or I'm on the, I'm on the boardwalk. But the cigarette butts were where? Everywhere? Cigarettes is a very massive issue, honestly. Um, so not only cigarette butts, people were smoking everywhere. We got complaints with regards to smoking. We got complaints with regards to cigarette butts. Oftentimes, uh, they'd be... It is really everywhere. Um, it's hard to pinpoint exact location, but if you're walking down some of the streets and you look out by the rail sidewalks, there's... You're not talking only about the community park, you're talking about all over town? The community park, I would feel in general, is much better about the cigarette butts, but um, there's still people smoking in the park, and it's kind of a... It, yeah, it was definitely prevalent in both uh, the town area as well as the beach area. Um, beach area, mostly the main areas be points of... Uh, big points, I suppose, so the gazebos down there, when we would show up, we had a couple pictures that uh, unfortunately just didn't turn out very well, so we can include them, uh, of the, between the tracks in the boardwalk. Um, one where we came there, it was just covered. Um, that was an irregularity, um, but we definitely noticed it tons. Um, the planters as well, people used those as just we, we do have the option from the island health uh, officials that have, have requested that we, we ban smoking in parks trouble is we how do you how do you enforce that and that's that's an issue that we're struggling with in terms of the same thing with the dogs off leash but th those are those are important issues and uh, it's a revelation that people are smoking to that extent so uh, thanks very much for that insight and um, you know uh, I, what we'll do is through the PDBA we'll we'll keep you informed from time to time as to what's happening as we work together with the PDBA because I know there are things in here that are near and dear to the PDBA also in terms of the comments and the things that you found out. So thanks again. Thank you very, very much. You're to be congratulated for doing a great job. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Next, we have, ladies and gentlemen, a delegation from the Access Oceanside uh, Association, a report on accessibility, and Mr. Regan Myers. Regan, welcome, Regan. a brief rundown. Every couple of years, our group um, takes city council, some people from public works, uh, shop owners, business people around the downtown um, to show what kind of infrastructure needs to be changed to make it comfortable. Because a lot of disabled folks, they just go to Nanaimo. And we want to keep the, the money here. If we keep the money here, well, then we can do these improvements and make it, you know, uh, more well known. Um, I think, in general, as you know, the demographic here is mostly above retirement age. Now, they're taxpayers. I I feel that they're paying taxes. They should get some bang for their buck. Now, what I'm going to show you, if I can find the the go button here. Um, from current slide, let's do that. 
<coughs> tell you a little bit about our organization. We liaise with uh, city council. We bring in people that can educate us and city council and further on down the road to uh, make people aware of uh, the challenges that are out there. So that's why we put, we used to call it mayor in a chair, you know, but basically it's everyone we can get that has some influence, council members, things like that, to actually make some changes. So, as I was saying, we host the Walk Wheel About to bring mobility issues, navigating Parksville's downtown, and this is a real life experience as any of, any of the folks here, like Mary or Mayor, uh, participated in this. So it's a first-hand thing. It's like real life. It's like happening to you because you're in this mobility device. Could be from, you know, no choice of your own. But uh, in any event, this happened last May. And uh, we had a couple of meetings over the summer. And we discussed that, yes, we should bring this stuff to city council. We should basically make a report. So some of the attendees, there was Connor Banks there, I really like that young man, he really wants to make a change. And uh, Greg Greenshields from Life Support, he supplies a lot of the devices that our citizens have to use. And as you can see, the mayor and I think his name is Brian from Operations, they were in for the experience as well. So um, we had some of our people, we had the news there, Barb Reed from um, Paticle and uh, Gail, they were helping get this together, assigning different wheelchairs to different people. As you can see, Mark's up there, and he's in one of probably the most difficult things to get around town in, and that's a manual wheelchair. We were talking about the experience that these young lads here found out about our main sidewalks. People don't like them. Well, you got to try it in a mobility device. It's really a really exacerbates the situation. Like you can be stopped cold in your tracks by uneven pavement. So we invited the advisory design panel to come and uh, because I think that some of these issues are going to go across their desk as well. So there's Mary Beal. She's trying out a scooter. So there's different things. There's scooters. What I'm in is called a power wheelchair. This will go in stores whereas scooters sometimes won't. They're too big even though uh, store owners still decide to pack the ends of the aisles and make it quite difficult for us to get through, um, you know, it should be brought to light more often than not. For example, if it's Halloween, well, when I had kids, I couldn't buy anything for them. They, you couldn't get around the stores. Try and buy a pair of shoes in Parksville for your kids. It's not going to happen, right? And so, uh, you know, we'd talk with the store owners and say, hey, look, we've got money. You know, and there's a huge amount of us here. Like, it, it, people don't realize. And I think that the money that we have as a, as a community um, should be kept here in Parksville. So we left from City Hall. We went down Craig Street. And we're going to find, down on Craig Street, you're going to find s sidewalks that are uneven, very narrow, uh, difficult for someone in a wheelchair and their aid even to get down the sidewalk. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about some of the real issues. Um, I find that these issues are global. <laughs> it's not just Parksville. But, for example, the curb cuts that we have right outside the building here. Actually, these are photos from right at this corner right here. Now, the curb cuts, they go into the center of the intersection. They don't go to the crosswalk this way or this way. They go this way. So not only for people that are visually challenged, they're being steered, as it says here, right into the middle of the intersection. Now, if their hearing wasn't just precise, we'd have a problem. So as you can see there, the wheelchair itself has to go out into the intersection to get over to the crosswalk, as you can see there. Now this confuses drivers. They want to go around the corner and you're going out this way and then you're coming back to go across that crosswalk. So you're often faced with the front end of a car hoping that they're gonna stop. And uh, so, I mean, us guys in our power machines, we can often get out of the way, but not ladies, older ladies with walkers and wheelchairs. It's just 
accidents waiting to happen. Um, other things, obstructions in sidewalks and curb cuts. There's one out here that's quite famous on the corner. It, it's a guy wire for the light pole there or telephone pole and it's right in the access. If you were visually challenged, you could walk right into it without knowing. If your cane happened to be going this way, you'd walk right into it. And what it's really all about is liability, isn't it? If pedestrians and people in mobility devices are having a problem, ultimately it could be a liability issue. Um, so I don't know really what to do about these curb cuts. I mean, it would be huge to redo them, <laughs> it's insane. But I'm suggesting that all new ones that we're gonna put in in the city, consult with the AOA or make them go straight to the sidewalks instead of steering people out into the middle of the intersection. Um, like it's an actual curb where the crosswalk is. You can't get down it in a, well you could, but you might not get back up it. All right, so. Now, more issues with wheels. Um, it would be really great if all of the parking spots were code, but as it turns out through our research, we find that most of the parking lots here in Parksville are privately owned, perhaps not even owned by the people who are renting the stores or the businesses that are there. So the communication between the store businesses or owners and then the owner of the parking lot, that's a, that's a communication that very rarely happens. They contract out who, who's gonna paint the lines. Well, the fellows that paint the lines, they don't necessarily know code, you know? And <laughs> like, what is there maybe five or six parking spots in the city that are code out of the 125 or whatever there is? So myself, I have a van that the only way I can get in and out of it is out the side. So a regular sized parking spot is not gonna work. You'll get trapped out of your vehicle or you'll damage the vehicle next to you or you know, it's, it's a, a continual thing that's just not good. All we're saying is just build them to code, make them the 13 feet wide or whatever they're supposed to be. And then you'll have a lot less problems. Uh, you'll have a lot, um, well, what we usually do as a group because there isn't a lot of these, we search around the parking lots for the end of the, of the row. But then that puts us right out into the traffic as well. But we find that that's probably the best place to park. Even those spots that are at the end of the row, the handicapped ones are not <laughs> the proper size. So it's, that's all we're asking is just code would be wonderful. Uh, the next uh, picture there is of thresholds for stores be stopped cold by just hitting that threshold if it's not proper. Now a lot of these thresholds that are in place, for example on Craig Street, 35 bucks gets you one that is flat out level at any hardware store. And um, the, the, these ones are, are just not safe if you were, like there's some grades down to these stores and sometimes grades up. So if you're in a walker, what's going to happen if your walker stops and you don't? You know, so once again, it's a liability issue, but I, I still think that there uh, should be some sort of downtown revitalization to go along with what the previous fellas said, the sidewalks are terrible. As uh, some of our councillors and the mayor know by pushing around some of these things. See there, there's an example of Craig Street. The sidewalk's basically too narrow. Mark's gonna barely get by that truck. And uh, so it, the unevenness is also a trip hazard. You know, we know that you're grinding them down here and there, but I don't think you can keep up with the trees. <laughs> the trees seem to be. So there are answers for that. You can actually put a well casing down before the tree, and that'll keep any roots far away from any kind of surface. So that, that's one answer to that. Now. As these boys were talking about previously, the crosswalk that's at the, uh, uh, what is it, the DQ there? Well, it was like uh, Brian from Operations and Connor Banks barely made it across, you know? Like, and they're in, one of them was motorized. 
so you know you picture yourself with a or a woman that has two or three kids in a stroller and you're trying to get across there it's it's a tough situation and also that particular intersection and there are quite a few of them where the sewer grate is in the crosswalk now this particular one is the worst one because the the, the rungs go the same way as you would so any wheel that is narrower than this, which is all walker wheels, all manual wheelchair wheels, if they go in there, what's going to happen? Are people going to fall out of their wheelchair or fall over from the walker beat? And it's not really marked. It doesn't have yellow paint on it or, or anything. But you can get different grades, you know, just to prevent any kind of problem that way. <coughs> So I say that this was truly a walk in our shoes for the city staff that went on it, as well as we equipped people with some visual, visual challenges, gave them the idea of what macular degeneration is, and they have a black spot right here, and uh, heavy sunglasses, you know, made, made them realize a little bit of what's going on. So there was only about four city blocks we went around. Everybody was really quite tired, especially if you're trying to push a wheelchair if you've never done it before. Um, we're asking that you work with the uh, Access Oceanside Association to make a more accessible Parksville for everyone. Uh, and as we say, if more accessible shopping is in Parksville, more funds will stay and support local business. Another issue is proper signage in the community park. There's been an issue over the parking spots that were in front of the, the bathrooms there. Well, to me, it's the same thing when it snows drive over that sign, nobody sees it. And of course there's no enforcement. But what would really help is in front of those designated handicap spots, which are to code, they're actually the right size, put a sign up because it's the same thing when it snows. There are no handicap spots in Parksville when it snows because you can't see the sign. That's what people say. Also when it's raining, it's really hard to get one. <laughs> so as a volunteer group, we wish to thank the participants, which I think were very brave to go out there and do this, and the consideration of Council for a more inclusive Oceanside. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is what our goals are for the future. Um, one of them is to hire a coordinator for communications, event planning, media, bringing more than 50% of the taxpayers, let them have a voice because more than half of those people use a mobility device. So we're talking more than 25% of our population in Parksville uses a mobility device. Like a cane can go down a sewer hole, you know? There's lots of problems with different things like that. Another one of our goals is to create another access guide for Parksville. We did one in 2009, and I quite think it was a success. It was. Uh, given out free. We have it at all of the places like SOS and any place, any tourist place, which has a guide to Parksville shopping, accessible guide to Parksville, has access to all of the parks and how you deal with it, how you get to it. We want to be that squeaky wheel that bugs you guys all the time to try and keep on it. And we want to work with you too to find out what the next project is. Um, for example, the walkway down to the park well, let's get the advisory design panel on board. Let's start working on it because it's not going to happen anytime soon. It's going to take some development time, funding time, and all of that stuff. So I think it's a good idea to start some of these issues and start talking about them as soon as we possibly can. So thanks for listening. We really want to work with town, council, and operations and infrastructure because that's where it seems it all is. Uh, the, the creaky, uneven sidewalks that Mark went down in his wheelchair. I mean, I really got to commend the guy. I mean, we were all sweating coming back. But, but, uh, but I didn't. I didn't last that all that life. I think halfway through, I, I changed with a mobile, with mobile, <laughs> mobile wheelchair. It was killing me. Well, that's a, that's a, that's an experience too. The electric ones, you know, like you sometimes can't go into stores. They won't let you in. So. Thanks, Reagan, very much. Uh, you know, the, uh, the Access Oceanside Association has been in existence now since 2008, and it's all about accessibility and inclusion. 
unfortunately, in Canada, what's missing is a Disabilities Act like they have in the United States. We don't have that. There's all kinds of stories around that people are are uh, are discriminated against basically because of because yep. of the uh, because of the accessibility and inclusion. Yep. So on that note, uh, Reagan, uh, I'm going to ask members of council if they have any questions. Councillor Powell. I don't have any questions, but I do have a couple comments. Uh, my brother was a quadriplegic, and we were in Quinell, and it was when Rick Hansen was doing a round the world tour to bring to light people in wheelchairs. And the first thing that that city did was change all their slopes onto the road from the sidewalks. And of course, they never worked because they didn't have the right, they would, like you say, dropped them into the middle of the road. And I know your frustration uh, when Joe was, would park, somebody would be parked in the handicapped parking. Oh, I'm just running in for a minute. And so I managed to get my hands on these little stickers that said, if you're not handicapped when you park here, you will be when you leave. And I would stick them on people's windows. <laughs> I got because smacked it's frustration. for doing that. It's frustration. <laughs> you know, you see an able-bodied person run in to the liquor store or the grocery store, yeah. and you got somebody that has a wheelchair, can't get out of the car. Yep. And, you know, it's disrespectful. It's, it's frustrating for the person that actually needs the wheelchair parking. And I actually did stick those stickers on signs, and then I'd sit and watch and see what they do when they give out. <laughs> but, well, you know, even now, I thought we had dealt with the issue. Like, I thought we were moving leaps and bounds. But after that report, I never thought of the greats. I never thought of it. Like, I thought we were doing a better job as far as dumping people, like, like you said, into the middle of the road instead of the crosswalk. Mm -hmm. um, having different obstacles there. Like, I think you made a, a couple of really good points about uh, businesses, being able to access businesses, mm -hmm. like you people to pay taxes too, right? People in wheelchairs, people who are handicapped, pay taxes, and they also spend money in the community if they can get in. And I think that's a real important part of this. And so thank you very much for your presentation. Oh, you're very welcome. Uh, going back to what you were saying about the stickers, well, the BC Paraplegic Association used to give out stickers for you to put on cars. I was quite happily putting one on a car, and I got smacked. It was almost hard enough to knock me out of my wheelchair. He said, I'm going to get you for damaging my vehicle. You know, and he is in a 4x4 four four that is up here to step into the thing, you know. I don't know what disabled folks could use those kinds of... I've seen motorcycles there, but, you know, not all disabilities are in the forefront. There's a lot of hidden ones. Yeah. I, I might add that the engineering staff have been, have been attending uh, the AOA meetings over the last year or two and uh, getting instant feedback and working on... I think there's, there's, there's a certain amount of consultation going on, too. Always, the projects yeah. are being put forward, yeah. yeah. Any, any other members of council have any comments? On that note, Regan, thank you very, very much for coming, and uh, give my best regards to everybody on the committee. I know you've got a great working well, committee. So everybody works hard. Stop by sometime. I will. I will. Oh, and if anybody else wants to, it's usually the second or third Wednesday of the month. It, right in, and any, everybody's welcome. We need more volunteers. We're all volunteers, so everyone here is a volunteer. <laughs> but that's what makes the world go round for us, is volunteers. Councillor Patterson. It's, um, the next meeting is next Wednesday yes. at 1 o'clock, September 16th, just upstairs in yep. room 200. Room 200 and, you, yeah. and you can take the uh, elevator up yep. and that too. So. Yep, hope to see some of you there. It'd be great. And thank you for listening, everybody. Daniel, do you have a uh, device? Do you have a PowerPoint? Okay. Thanks again, Regan. Okay. Thank you.
Our next presenter is the manager of transit operations from the regional district of Nanaimo. Uh, he's a friend of the city of Parksville. I, uh, I have occasion to call him on a regular basis. And he's here tonight to talk about uh, smaller buses, which we've been waiting for for a long time. So welcome, Daniel. And uh, turn on the microphone and over to you. Thank you very much, Your Worship and Council. Thank you for having me tonight for this delegation. Um, I thought it was very timely talking about uh, downtown Parksville and about accessibility and then falling into transit because transit is based off the fact that people can walk and cycle and blend into those transportation modes. So uh, without further ado, I'll get started. I'll give you an overview of our existing system. Uh, I will give you, get into the details on exactly what we've been expanding on and some of the new details that we've been uh, just recently working on. Uh, but right now we start off in our system at 49 conventional buses. Uh, we have 25 compressed natural gas buses, the CNG, that you'll see drive through Parksville on the 91 inner city bus. And then we have 24 diesel buses. So those are the large 40 foot buses. We also have 14 custom buses. They are um, an Arbok style Chevy chassis, um, but ultimately they're the small bus and they're used for handy dart as well as can be used and what we'll get into uh, for regular service as well. Uh, we have over 11,000 trips per weekday and we have over 2.8 million rides annually. So the regional district system is actually just behind Victoria is the largest system um, competing with Kelowna and some of the other largest systems outside of TransLink. Uh, the Route 88 Parks Hill uh, operates Monday to Friday from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, on Saturday from 8 a.m. to 6.30 p.m. Um, its ridership to date is approximately about 21,000 or just over 21,000. And then the Route 91 inner city uh, operates Monday to Friday from 6.30 to 10.30 p.m. It does have certain trips that actually operate directly to BC Ferries, so there's convenience tied into direct access to BC Ferries. Uh, Saturday from 7.30 to 7.30, and Sunday from 8.30 a.m. to 9 o'clock p.m. And its ridership is sitting uh, currently at approximately about 118,000 rides. Uh, so for as a regional system, that uh, regional route that does tie in Parksville, Qualcomm Beach, and Nanaimo, uh, it does function fairly well. Uh, the transit funding. Uh, I know you, your worship, you're very familiar with transit funding, but I thought that would be good for council. Um, it's quite unique the way that province has uh, delegated some of the powers down through transit to BC Transit as a provincial agency and then the local governments itself. Uh, the operating costs are cost shared with BC Transit at a rate of 53.31 of the local government, the regional district, and 46.69% uh, BC Transit. Uh, the regional district as the local government also gets all the revenue from uh, the system and that offsets all ultimately our local share. So we're actually paying approximately about 32% compared to that 53%. And that is actually one of the best uh, across the province. Uh, custom is a little bit differently within the handy dirt system. Uh, the RDN actually pays 33.31% and then the pro uh, province through BC Transit pays 66.69%. Um, that also gives a bit of an understanding of why the province sometimes doesn't necessarily want to fund handy dirt systems, and you might hear that a little bit, and I think you will be hearing it more in the media sometimes uh, with the demand of aging populations across BC. Uh, but naturally, it is, it's a, a much more expensive service. So the number 88 Park Hill improvements. Um, uh, your Worship, you've been very, I think, well-spoken at the Transit Select Committee for the Regional District of uh, the Avenue and fighting for smaller buses and more uh, closely designed systems to Parksville and then also for the uh, entire area within the Regional District. Uh, so one thing that we implemented just on the last Sunday, September 6th, was actually a small bus that is an independent route that will stay in Parksville for the entire day. Um, one of the principles that we'll get, I'll go through in the, um, the rest of the PowerPoint is that sometimes we ultimately will use a 40 foot bus to try to tie into another route for in, uh, tying to a service. Uh, so the very first section of the 88, the very first run of the day will still be a large bus as it's working its way north. And then the very last one as it's the bus is coming back down uh, through the highway will actually do the route 88 for cost efficiency. Um, we've also been trying to work with Wembley Mall and I'll go through some of the more details, but we have relocated the bus stop to uh, Wembley Road. Uh, outside of the mall car, car parking area. Uh, we had for a um, number of years complaints on a weekly basis from people that were shopping there, um, interacting with our transit vehicle in sometimes a negative fashion where they felt that a bus shouldn't be entering inside the mall. And we also had our drivers uh, concerned about entering into the mall property and sometimes um, displaying safety concerns with it. Uh, so one thing we've been trying to do is work with Wembley Mall to actually have the stop located directly beside the BC government liquor store. Uh, that will make it very close, very convenient. Um, we still haven't got their A-OK -okay quite yet, but I'm, I'm hopeful that that will be very shortly. 
and we also are providing direct service to the Oceanside Health Centre. And that is something that with a 40 foot bus we weren't able to do, uh, the parking lot just wasn't built for it, but with a small bus we are able to. Uh, this is one of the map just to give you an idea of where the bus actually operates. Um, and you can see it basically travels down, comes down Pym uh, Temple. Uh, the routing over the last number of years, we have tried different routing due to some uh, infrastructure upgrades and some other, uh, I won't say demands, but uh, comments and, and feedback from the public. Ultimately, what we found with Parksville residents really do like this routing around uh, Stanhope, Pym specifically in Temple. Uh, that is the routing that we are going to stay on at, at the moment, and I'll kind of walk you through where we're going to be going into the future. So think of this as kind of phase one, a small bus on this set route and where we can go from there as well. Uh, the Wembley Mall and the uh, Oceanside Health Centre. So we've also implemented two shelters. Um, your Worship and Council, you might have noticed them on Highway 19A in front of Wembley Mall. Uh, they are a new design. They're low maintenance shel um, shelters, low uh, mesh, so they can't be vandalized with glass being broken and things. Uh, the regional district actually paid for those shelters to be placed, put in, and then the maintenance will be done by Parksville and the staff at Parksville. Uh, but luckily they are low maintenance, and where we've actually placed them inside the city of Nanaimo's limits, uh, we've had zero problems with maintenance um, and zero vandalism issues. And then the Oceanside Health Centre, uh, um, as I s said before, we have a, a stop directly in front of the health centre. Uh, what we've done on a temporary basis working with them is just put a temporary stop in until we can determine exactly where they would like us to pull up, uh, but it will be directly in front. Uh, the big bus versus small bus argument. So this can be almost an hour presentation, but succinct into one slide. Um, there's a benefit when you get to a certain size to implement a small vehicle. Uh, ultimately, it's due to ridership uh, frequency when you can ultimately put it in one area. Um, the term interlining is where one bus goes from one route to another route. So for example, the route 88 might become the 91 as I described. And then at that time, if we have a large bus that's already on the road, that would make the most sense. So that's where like the last run of the 88 of the day will be a large bus that goes through Parksville. Um, outside of that though, um, we've been able to actually achieve a level of service in Parksville where we're uh, putting a, a one bus that stays up here the entire day and is a small vehicle uh, is actually efficient. We're not having to bring it back and forth, deadhead it back and forth to our, our operation center, our yard. And that ultimately means that there's a lower cost to the municipality and it's better for the general public that the bus is there and it's not bouncing around. The BC Transit uh, fleet vehicles. So BC Transit actually owns all of the vehicles across the province outside of TransLink and then they basically lease it to the local governments like the regional district or other areas. Uh, currently right now there are some double decker high capacity buses, a few in Victoria. Um, outside of that there's a few in uh, Kelowna, nothing in our system. The heavy duty, the 40 foot bus. Uh, the big difference that I want to highlight here between heavy duty and then light duty on the side is that the heavy duty is uh, um, amortized over 13 years. Um, a brand new CNG bus costs approximately about $620,000, amortized over 13 years, gives you an idea, and then cost shared as well. Um, you can have standees on a large 40-foot 40, 40 bus, so it has about approximately about 30 seats, but you can also fit standees, you get between 60 to 70 people depending on how close they want to be and how comfortable they want to be. <laughs> Uh, the light duty, uh, which is what we have in, the, in our system and what we'll be, is in Parksville now, uh, has a five-year lifespan, so the difference of 13 years to five years, this gives you a difference in the, the, the vehicle itself. It has up to 20 seats, and the vehicle that is in Parksville now has 20 seats, um, and there's no standees allowed. So that's the biggest variable within the 40-foot conventional bus, going back down to a small light duty bus, is you can't have standees. So before we actually implemented the small bus, we did look at the ridership closely and made sure that we weren't going to be running into issues. And if we do run into issues, we will have a large bus closer by where we're not leaving people behind. But that's something that we'll be looking for and, and monitoring as we go forward with um, into the year and into the next year. In the middle, the medium duty, and this is where basically I wanted to say with phase one, this is where we are with one small bus, phase, uh, phase one implemented. Um, moving towards more of a phase two or phase three, we'd be looking at um, implementing something like a medium duty bus. Uh, BC Transit right now has a few of them uh, around the province, not a lot, just kind of a handful. But what they are is basically a blend between the small bus and the big bus. So instead of being 40 feet, a lot of them are 26 to 30 feet. Uh, you're allowed standees, so that's one of the big benefits is that rather than just a small bus, you can still get standees. They're not so large as a 40 foot bus that they're intimidating to the public and, and that big capacity. 
uh, and they also have an eight to 10 year lifespan, so it's somewhere in between, and the cost can be somewhere in between. So I gave you the heavy duty $620,000. Uh, interestingly, the light duty costs about $250,000, and that's amortized over five years, so it gives you an idea of what, where BC Transit sometimes purchasing vehicles tries to balance out those life cycle costs and the maintenance costs and all those other variables. And uh, last, all of our uh, plans and all of our expansion plans in this last update was based on our 2014 future plan. I'd clicked a link here because I'm hoping that this will be available to uh, to Mayor Council after for the fact or the public. Uh, but more importantly, it is available online. Um, people can look at it, read it, and get updated on exactly where we are at and where we're going to be going in the future. Thank you very, very much, Daniel. That's an extremely, uh, extremely comprehensive report. And I guess from last night's RDN uh, board meeting, we know that uh, we'll be getting more uh, CNG buses to uh, replace the... Uh, we've got 25 now. I guess we're going to be getting close to 25 more at some point in time. Uh, your Worship, that is correct. Mm -hmm. um, what we brought forward last night to the Committee of the Hold, the Regional District, was a replacement of our 24 diesel buses. Um, right now, within the getting into specifics, I apologize, but of the diesel buses, there's a uh, split between 1996 and 1998 buses. Um, they're old, and they're ultimately going to be replaced by BC Transit over the next three years completely. Because we already have 25 CNG buses and that infrastructure and that major cost, that's where there's a strong business case to be actually purchasing and replacing all 24 with um, uh, brand new CNG buses and ultimately having it so they have just a 13 year life cycle and the costs are amortized into that. Before I uh, turn it over to members of council for questions for Daniel, I should point out that we're ahead of schedule thanks to Daniel. I don't think this was supposed to come online till about 2017, but maybe with a little bit of pestering and begging and crying and whatever, we got, we got a bus ahead of schedule. And of course, the, uh, the name of the game is at some point in time, uh, there'll be budgetary implications, but at some point in time, these smaller buses could go into greater areas within, within Parksville to reduce uh, the use of automobiles. Uh, one of the things that comes to mind is on resort way, uh, we've had complaints about that for people. And the PDBA at one, one summer provided a bus service to and from there, but if we could get the, uh, if we could get the transit, pardon me. Four, four, sorry, but if we could get the transit to, the system to go through there, uh, you know, rather than pick them up on the highway, it, it's closer and it's more, it's handier. And of course, there's all, all kinds of other other uh, roads that go uphill, and then we, we'll talk about it in the future. Okay, any any questions from members of council? Uh, Councillor Powell, Councillor Salter, and then Councillor Beal. Thank you very much for your presentation. I'm very excited to have a small bus. It makes business sense and it makes better sense to for people in our community. I know that you were just giving a presentation on Parksville, but are there any gonna, is this type of bus also going to be in the outlying areas, uh, Coombs, Arrington? Like, is there a route out there as well? Uh, through your worship, no, there is not right now through Coombs or Arrington, uh, Arrington that area. Uh, right now, in part of this expansion, we did implement a small bus on the BC Ferries uh, uh, route for Departure Bay. That's called the 25 route in Nanaimo. Uh, so that's one area that's been al allocated. And it's also on kind of the books be slated to be implemented in, in Qualicum Beach in the next couple of years. Councillor Beal. Oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Salter, then Councillor Beal. Thank you, Worship. I'm just want th thank you for your presentation. It was it was really good, uh, but I just I missed um, something on the last slide. I'm wondering if you can just zip back there. So the m medium duty and then the light duty, and so on the medium duty bus, that one is also um, less than 35 feet. So is that could be a 26 footer or? Uh, th through your worship, yes, that's correct. 26 to 30 feet, depending on the 26 manufacturer. 26 to 30 feet, and so could the light duty one. Uh, the light duty is uh, predominantly smaller. It, would, it wouldn't be anything. Um, it's usually purchased um, under 26 feet, 26 to 28 feet. Oh, okay, so 26 to 28 for that one and maybe 26 to 30 for the medium duty. Yes, through your worship, there's also a change in the body style because the way the light duty is having the engine at the front and having almost a cab at the back, um, it, it is completely low floor and fully accessible, but the l ramp coming off the side changes up the dimensions inside the vehicle. Okay. Uh, going into something like a medium duty, it, it, from the picture, it looks like it's a large 40-foot bus. It still has that flat front, but ulti ultimately it's maximizing the seating, seating capacity and allowing the, the chassis to be more robust to carry the passengers. So on the medium duty, um, 
There's still less than 25 seats, although there's 20 on. I'm just trying to, so there's 20 on the light duty, and on the medium duty there's less than 25 seats? Through your worship, yeah, that is correct. The light duty arranges up to 20 seats, so the bus that we have currently in Parksville has 20 seats, but it goes between 16 to 20 depending on the wheelchair configuration. Oh, okay. Yes, I wondered. Okay. That makes sense. That makes sense to me, yeah. Thanks. Okay, Councilor Beal. Thank you, Your Worship, and thank you very much for the presentation. It was rather speedy, so I'm not sure I, you know, I got everything there. But a question I have, because I do get calls and concerns and emails on occasion from residents who are wanting and needing transit, and is there a mechanism by which people can share ideas or address questions or concerns to transit in this area? That's my question. Through Your Worship, yes, there are. The best way to contact is there's a website available either through bctransit.com or the regional district, and there is comment sections there where you can send your feedback in. And we do have a process, a planning process, that we do take all that feedback, and then on usually an annual or depending on the planning process, we implement that. We look at what the feedback is, and then we ask the public if that's still how they're feeling and where we should go from there. Thank you. That's really helpful. And another question, I'm just trying to make sure that I understand it correctly. The 88, the plan is that there's a bus stop that's been moved to Wembley Road, right? And then the bus stop to take the 91 is actually on the highway. So, in fact, if someone is moving from the one spot to the other, they need to go make their way through the mall and down to the highway in order to catch the 91? Through Your Worship, what would happen is if somebody asked for a connection from the 88 to the 91, the driver would actually let them off on the corresponding stop on the highway. So there wouldn't be a pedestrian commuter. Okay. I did understand at some point that there was that possibility of a connection. Okay. And finally, I understand that there is a website that's supposed to help one plan routes, and I guess I could just find it through RDN Transit. You're talking about there's a Google site, is there not? Yes. Yes. I've just personally, I'll say this, personally I have not had a lot of success with it. It seemed like you already had to know the number of the bus in order to find out what you want, as opposed to just where I want to go, and then it would tell me the number of the bus. So anyway, I was just curious about all that. I'm very, very interested in transit. I think it plays a huge role in improving people's lives, honestly, and reducing strain on the environment. If it's easier to use the bus, then I hope that people will be doing that. And for many of our residents who do have mobility issues or are not able to drive, it's really important to them, so it's a really important service. Finally, and then I'll stop, the announcements that the provincial government was freezing funds for transit, has that caused great concern or slowing down plans and proposals at your end? Through your worship, I'll answer the last question first. Yes, that is definitely a challenge for ourselves as well as the other local governments. We are actually the only system across BC and BC Transit that's been able to have an expansion because of the way we had it in our plans and some of the things that we were able to do internally. That's a positive. I think it's up to the province and through BC Transit. I think BC Transit is also working to try to prove how transit funding is important, but that is under review right now, and BC Transit is going through a review process through their ministry as well. Sorry, through your worship, if I can just answer the question regarding the trip planner. That is tied through with Google Trip Planner. It is available. If you type in whether BC Transit or RDN Transit, Nanaimo, Parksville, it will come in. From there, you can actually plan a trip depending on where you're going, so you type in the street location. It isn't perfect. Google is kind of at the mercy of Google, but we are able to make incremental changes to it. It only allows windows of opening to make changes. But we've also just recently found that there's also, as we grow into a certain size system, third-party applications, software companies design apps and different application purposes. And there's one that we actually just determined today that gives a direct access, stop-by-stop everything, because we've become big enough that it's of interest to them to attach that. 
so that's something that we are going to be sharing on our facebook and twitter and trying to promote to people that it's free um it's accurate and it's also a great source of way using technology mr. salter ah thank you worship i just one more question i forgot to ask you um when you were speaking about ridership so you may have explained this and i could have missed it um you said there were 21,000 riders on route 88 and uh, 118 on route 91 are, is that from this area or is this from including the Nanaimo area? Uh, through your worship, so the 91 would be could be including areas including anywhere along the route, so Nanaimo, Parksville, or in, into Qualcomm Beach. Uh, route 88 would be predominantly Parksville, uh, so that would be people that were getting on, getting off in Parksville, and those are trips that would be um, tallied together. So when you're, so what's the follow up? Um, and so when you're. Um, looking at numbers and um, how many people are going to use the, the buses, um, the actual numbers that you could use would be from, from Route 88, for, which would be more certain. Um, sorry, could you repeat the question? I didn't fully So when you're looking at the numbers uh, for, for the buses that you're going to be utilizing, um, so the actual numbers that you could use for this area would have to be from Route 88, is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Which is 21,000. Yeah. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Daniel, for coming all the way from Nanaimo. You know, you, I know that you have a new young son and you've got to go back home and hope he doesn't have colic tonight or <laughs> something like that. Um, Daniel, you, uh, you do come to Parksville and, and surrounding areas, Qualicum Beach, on a, on a regular ba on a regular basis, in the sense that when you're looking for input in terms of route changes and stuff like that, and that's well advertised, is it not? No. Through your worship, yes, and I think that's something that is important. The planning process, we do make sure we do take into account uh, Parksville residents, outlying area residents outside of Parksville, um, and then also Qualicum Beach. And the chair of the Transit Select Committee is actually. Uh, the mayor of, of Qualcomm Beach, and he has a strong interest in Qualcomm Beach and Parksville as well, so he's spoken directly to me about that as well, multiple times as well as, as your worship. Thanks very much again for coming. We appreciate it. We'll, see, we'll, we'll invite you again. It's gone, it's gone well. Thank you. All right, at this point in time at the meeting, we're moving into reports, and our first report is from Mr. Butterworth. Would you please give us the background on the issue of regarding the appointment of a municipal auditor? Mr. Butterworth. Yes, Your Worship. Um, under the community charter, the city is required to appoint an auditor to, to conduct the annual financial statement audit of the city's financial statements. Our current auditor has been the municipality's auditor for the last 32 years. They were appointed as a city auditor for a three-year term in 2010, and their contract was renewed for a further two-year term in 2013 to audit the 2013 and 14 financial statements. The city's purchasing policy requires a selective proposal call be made to qualified audit firms for services over $20,000 and the city's audit services have been at a cost of a little over $30,000 over the last several years when you include AWS and ERWS audit. So a competitive bid process um, was required and, um, and we went through that and received uh, four bids back. Um, in order to ensure audit, auditor continuity is recommended that the city auditor be appointed for a five-year term commencing with the audit of the 2015 financial statements, and the recommendations are as per the report. Do I have a mover and a seconder for the recommendations? Moved by Councillor Beal, seconded by Councillor Salter. Discussion on the, on, the, uh, on, the, on the motions? Seeing no discussions, I'm going to call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? Thank you, that is carried. The next report we have, we're all familiar with, we've discussed it many times, is the 2016 Permissive Taxation Exemption Applications. Mrs. Comas, would you please give us the background on the issue regarding this particular topic? Uh, yes, Your Worship, as you noted, this is an annual report presented to Council. Um, in this particular year, um, we are providing, recommending a 100% uh, tax exemption to the Lawn Bowling Club because of their lease agreement and also to the Curling Club 
because of the new policy council adopted with respect to the amount of their budget that goes into maintenance of the facility that they are currently using we have two new applications this year from the salvation army those are noted in the appendix attached to the report and the recommendations are as per the council agenda do i have a mover and a seconder for the recommendations moved by councillor beal seconded by councillor salter any discussion councillor salter so i'm looking at the railway um piece here um they're requesting it looks like just under seven thousand dollars and um i'm just wondering there hasn't been a train on that track since i think it was 2011 and so i'm wondering what it is that they're providing to the community um as far as the service and what volunteers are working with them and so on mrs comas uh, yes your worship in 2011 the council of the day adopted a bylaw which provides a permissive tax exemption to the island corridor foundation from 2011 to 2021 and that is part of our agreement and so as a result they receive the um, permissive tax exemption all communities do this because of, uh, because of the land what we don't pay anymore is we don't pay the fees that are required when the train because the train hasn't been running we haven't been paying our uh, our i guess they're installed they're monthly are they not mr butterworth help me here they're month we, we've we've stopped paying for quite some time now and so uh, but this is this is a, a, a taxation thing. that's not a <laughs> that's an interesting uh, it's an interesting point that you bring up well, they're not, they, they don't, they, they fail to, to meet the test of the community charter, and yet we're giving them these but, but the rail, $10, But the property itself, what it, what it may eventually serve, is may serve as a, as a trail, and th they would still want to have that, that taxation exemption for purposes of whatever, whatever it becomes. I, I considered that, and even so, we actually still cannot, according to the charter, exempt it until that's in place so we can't be waiting for something to happen in future on a piece of property um according to the charter so it's not that they can purchase it and wait for wait for it, the community to be able to utilize it and then we uh, and we exempt it up until that point we can't do that um but i do have something else i also wanted to mention and that is um i, I didn't see any any uh um any budget I, I mean i don't see where the dollars are going as far as the icf um is concerned um i'm not i'm not aware of what's going on with these dollars their earnings i don't know how much these people are earning <clears throat> i don't know how much is being spent what the profits are what the losses are like, there's no financials and yet we're um approving seven thousand dollars so I, that's uh, that's a big question for me when we don't get to see these these financials for this um community service and yet we're agreeing to to uh to provide seven thousand uh, dollars a year from the ratepayers uh the, the facetious answer is that you and a lot of other people including myself wonder about that Th that's information given the setup of the island corridor foundation that is only accessible to the island Cor corridor foundation and its board and uh, we don't uh, we don't know what that is we don't know uh, we don't know what the revenue is and we don't know exactly where the revenue is being uh, being expended i can tell you that a meeting in january of 2013 here in parksville qualicum beach was president parksville uh all of the, the two mayors and the councillors at the time and uh our mayor at the time asked the southern rail individual where they were spending money or did he know where they were spending money on repairing the rail line and he said he, he didn't he, he didn't have that information offhand and, and never got back to us but though, though that's a, that's an interesting issue and and f from my point of view uh that's to be pursued because we're still waiting we're still waiting to see when when the train is going to go i know that the situation is such that they're waiting to see whether the when and if the provincial and federal governments will give them their 15 million dollars and just um to follow up um the um the bridge and track has been pulled up down in victoria for repair 
so that train's not coming or going anywhere at this point. Um, but I am wondering, and I, I don't know if um, someone can respond to this, is there anything that we as a council can do to, um, to stop these dollars from rolling into that um, company, ICF? Um, is there anything we can do to, um, to stop that? I, I, I recognize that something happened uh, in 2011, but is there anything that this council can do now to, um, to mitigate sending, you know, uh, spending 7,000 taxpayer dollars every year on a train that isn't running anywhere? I, I don't, uh, with regards to the permissive taxation, we, we did pass it. I think that we're, we'll have to live with it until, until somebody makes up their minds in terms of what, what's going to happen with the rail line. Councillor Greer. Thank you, Your Worship. We, we've been asking the ICF for a number of years now for financials, and how come we can't get it? It's, it's because of the structure and the, and the rules under which they are governed. Uh, we've, at the RDN board, as your representative, I've, I've uh, brought this up on a number of occasions. Um, uh, it's, just, it's just simply the, the nature of the, the structure that they have, whereby they don't have to, an independent body, and they don't have to report to anybody but their board. Uh, it's. Um, it we could we could go on about this all night. I, I don't want to be. I don't want to labor the labor uh, belabor the conversation, but it's uh, what we're waiting for is we're waiting to see what's going to happen when something does not happen with regard to the rail line. And I'd be very surprised. One of the things, one of the situations we are faced with now in terms of bringing everybody up to date, is that. If they get the money, if they get the $15 million from the federal and provincial government, plus the money they've received from all the regional districts on the rail line, they're going to go out to tender to uh, repair repair the rail line. Uh, what the uh, with what Mr. Balthazar of the Southern Rail has said is that if those uh, offers for bids come in over over the $20.9 million, they're going to they're going to forget about it. Uh, we've said we, being uh, ourselves, uh, Qualicum Beach. All of the electoral area directors uh, south and north of, of Nanaimo have voted against giving, giving them the money because we, we didn't believe that for $20.9 million they could do it. But the RDN board, as a majority, uh, approved that, that loan. So that's, that's done. That's been, we don't go back there. That's been done and approved. And so we're, we're waiting. But I, uh, I can assure you that when, when whatever decision is made to proceed or not proceed, uh, I fully intend to bring to council some uh, some suggestion of some suggestion of a motion to find out exactly where where all this money has gone and what's what's been going on. But um, until that time, we're 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 stuck in we're stuck in limbo. Council, Mrs. Comas. <laughs> uh, your worship, through to Councillor Salter. Um, when this bylaw was enacted, it was enacted in accordance with Section 224 um, of the community charter and it was uh, <coughs> pardon me worded in such a way is that <coughs> pardon me until the status of the railway changes the um, permissive taxation uh, exemption applies and at the time that the bylaw was enacted the status of the railway was basically the same as it is right now so until something happens to either run a train on that track or make it a, a different use than what it currently is residing at, at that point in time, then council will be able to give consideration to a different track st tax structure. But basically, that permissive tax exemption for the railway was approved when that bylaw was adopted for the next 10 years. And basically what this its placement in this report is perhaps not as, as clear as it could be because you're not actually voting on that particular exemption because it was done already by bylaw. Yes, go ahead. That's right. So just to clarify, so, okay, so I won't be voting. This, this isn't part of the of this decision. No. Okay, well, that's, that's good to know because I couldn't support that. So thank you for that. Okay, so no further discussion. I'm going to call the vote on the permissive taxation exemption applications recommendations one to four. All those in favor? Opposed? Thank you. That is carried.
just as an aside, I'll promise everybody an update at some point in time as, as, as we know more on, on the rail line. It's important. Next report is Mrs. Comis. Would you please give us the background on the issue regarding the 2015 fall grant and aid applications? Uh, yes, Your Worship, once again, this is a uh, semi-annual report that comes before Council, asking Council to appoint two members of Council to uh, form the Grant and Aid Select Committee and with the Deputy Corporate Officer as support, consider and make recommendations on Grant and Aid applications that will be coming forward in the next little while. So before I call for a mover and a seconder, I'm going to add to that that Councillor Teresa Patterson and Councillor Leanne Salter be appointed to the GIA Select Committee. Mover and seconder. Moving by Councillor Salter, seconded by Councillor Oates. All those in favor? Opposed? Thank you, that's carried. I just wanted you to know that before you call the... <laughs> okay, is this your first time? On the grants and aid? Yes. Okay. Okay. Mrs. Comis, once again, appointment of election officers, this has regard with regards to the assent voting in, 2000, in November 21st, 2014. 15. Yes, Your Worship. As Council is aware, we are going forward on November 21st with an assent voting opportunity for borrowing funding toward the ERWS water treatment and intake and distribution lines. Um, Council is required by the Community Charter to appoint a or sorry, local government act to appoint a chief election officer and deputy chief election officer for the purpose of conducting the vote. And I'm, I'm recommending that um, deputy corporate officer Amanda Weeks be appointed as the chief election officer and that I will serve as her deputy. Moved by Councillor Oates, seconded by Councillor Powell. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Thank you. That is carried. Once again, Mrs. Comis, background on the issue of, uh, regarding advanced voting bylaw, which is uh, different from what we just did. Yes, Your Worship. We are required by law to hold two advanced voting opportunities, um, one of which is mandated by statute and the other of which must be mandated by bylaw. And so we are asking council authority to enact a bylaw to provide a special, uh, an advanced voting opportunity on November 18th. Moved by Councillor Oates, seconded by Councillor Greer. Any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Thank you. That is carried. We now come to the session on bylaws, and uh, this is the I need a mover and a seconder for the Parcel Advanced Voting Opportunities Bylaw 2015, number 1520. Moved by Councillor Salter, seconded by Councillor Oates. Any discussion? Questions? Councillor Patterson. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, just a kind of a quick question, and it may pertain to what we've already passed, and that um, in this council's term of office, and that I'd, I'd like to see if it's even remotely possible, a mail-in ballot. I know that I'll be away for this voting opportunity, and even with the advance voting of three days before that, that doesn't work. And we have so many um, senior citizens that do go out of the, the country at this time of year. So, um, this is Thomas, Thomas, please. Uh, yes, Your Worship, with the shortened time frame we have for preparation for the assent voting. I realize that this point in time it's not feasible yeah. whatsoever, but in this council's term of office, and that coming up into the next election, and if there was ever other things that may arise. <laughs> I don't expect to that in this term, but it is we something I'd like to look we to visit. We can certainly look at that for the next local general election, Your Worship.
i will repeat that, that council host a meeting with the board of education of school district number sixty nine qualicum trustees to discuss issues of mutual interest and that funding to cover the meeting costs be provided from council contingency. not a lot of money, i don't know what mrs. weeks, you got any idea, any idea what that is? not a lot of money okay, so do i have a mover and a seconder for that? moved by councillor powell, seconded by councillor beale, any further discussion? All those in favor, opposed, thank you, that is carried. Uh, very briefly, I wanted to uh, give you an update on the um, on the RDN committee, the whole meeting last night. Um, I, I voted in favor along with the majority of uh, the RDN board members to, uh, there was a presentation by the manager of water and utility services, I think. Mr. Squire, you're probably aware that uh, we're embarking on a, the challenges and opportunities for regional water resources with the RDN. Our staff would be working with that, and this is to cover a broad range of, of issues regarding water, and I, I supported that. And um, if you're interested, I can give you a copy of that report. I can leave it in your mailboxes, so just let me know. Uh, it's, uh, it's a fairly lengthy report, but it's, um, it's uh, the background is that the report provides background information on current and long-term climate tra trends for our region as it relates to water resource management. The report outlines processes and actions that are currently underway to address water protection challenges and a number of recommendations that will strengthen the region's ability to adapt to changing precipitation Patterson, patterns, Patterson, patterns, temperatures, and increased hot weather periods. Okay, so that's just an update on that, and I'll have more to talk about that as time goes by. Uh, we won't be meeting again as council uh, before the UBCM. I don't think we meet again this month, do we? So what I've done is I've, uh, I've arranged for meetings with the Minister of Agriculture, the Minister of Community Affairs, who haven't confirmed yet. I forget what Minister Bond's ministry is called, but we're asked to meet the Minister, Minister Bond. We're meeting with the Minister of Health, Terry Lake, and we're also meeting with, uh, I'll be meeting with the Premier. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave in your mailboxes over the next week or so uh, the presentations that uh, they're one-pagers, there's some reason, with the exception of the Minister of Agriculture, that's a little more detailed. The Minister of Agriculture has asked for a briefing note, so I believe you're going to be going to that, so we'll need a briefing note from you, Councillor Salter. But um, I'll, give you, I'll give you all that information. You're all, all invited to attend. We don't have the times yet, but usually uh, their offices are, it's usually in the, in the conference center itself. There's some small offices made available for those that you haven't been before. So I'll invite you to read that, become familiar with the issues. Uh, they are uh, the resort, uh, resort municipality initiative. They're the issue of having to hold a referendum when it re involves potable water. There's an issue on, on the whole issue of farming. And the, uh, the last issue is on the, uh, on the need for uh, doctor recruitment that we're working with with FORA with regards to the Oceanside area. So you can read those and uh, they're short, they're to the point, they're a page long. And uh, as, I, as I said before, well before the, the, the 21st of September, you'll have those in your mailboxes and with the information as to where and when those meetings will be held. Okay? So that's it for me. Let's go around the table. New business. Anybody got some new business? Councillor Powell. Thank you, Worship. Um, so as the liaison to the Chamber of Commerce, I've been asked to bring this motion forward. It's the 31st a Annual Chamber of Commerce Fantasy Auction. And the motion is that the city contribute $300 toward a bon, bon appetit from the City of Parksville auction package for the 31st Annual Parksville Chamber of Commerce Fantasy Auction and that funding be provided from council contingency. I'm sorry, if I turn that on. Uh, we're having the executive director of the immigrant, uh, immigrant, uh, new immigrant office in Nanaimo coming to make us a presentation in this forum. I, I'm hoping that there'll be uh, members from other municipalities. I believe uh, Mayor Westbrook told me today that he was coming. I don't know how many members of his council are coming. 
some of the electoral area directors are coming and we've extended invitations to the chamber of commerce, the, the PDBA, uh, the, um, the tourism association and uh, the construction association. So uh, keep that in mind if you can come. Yes, Councillor Beal. I'm just wondering if uh, an invitation has also been extended to the school district or BIU. I, I believe it has. We, we'll check with that tomorrow morning. Yes, Councillor Powell. I've invited certain members of the public that I thought might be interested, and I've invited, uh, I've also invited the press. Uh, given the, given the, we didn't know when we struck this meeting, which was a few months ago, in terms of the timing was probably in July, we didn't know that the refugee situation would be the way it is, but if anybody's got any questions about that, Ms. Schlosser, that's the executive director, has, has all that information and can answer a lot of questions, so should be an interesting meeting. See, I'll turn my microphone on again. Uh, special business, do I have a mover and a seconder so we move in camera pursuant to section 91A of the community charter? Moved by Councillor Beal, seconded by Councillor Powell. All those in favor? Opposed? Thank you, that is carried. Now I have. A, I need a mover and a seconder for adjournment. Councilor? No, not yet? Okay. What's that? Oh, I'd like to adjourn right away. So we're going to take a five-minute break, and then we'll get into in-camera.